Hello, 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 YouTube world. It's Miss Patty with For Your CNA, and I'm here to welcome you to another weekly live question and answer session. Uh, we do this every Thursday at three, where I come on and answer your questions about CNA training and testing and workplace issues and whatever else you want to talk about. Um, I always give a little mini lesson when we get started. So when you come in, give me a hi in the chat. Let me know that you're here and um, give me a thumbs up too if you like this. Um, and we're going to jump right into today's lesson. So um, hi, Jennifer. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. All right, so today we are going to talk about dignity. Oh, what happened to me? Oh my goodness, hold on a second. I've lost me. <laughs> hold on, let's see here. Oh goodness, 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 goodness. Okay, so let's see. There I am. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, technical difficulties here. All right. So today I want to talk about dignity. Now, this is something that um, if, if you guys have followed me at all, you know that I'm all about patient rights, um, you know, communicating with the patient, making sure that we're helping them appropriately, making sure that we're listening to them, and most of all, treating them like a human instead of a patient. I don't like that term patient. Because it seems to, in a lot of healthcare people's minds, it seems to kind of, I don't know how to say it nicely, but it kind of um, puts the patient in a lower category. And that can be really, really dangerous. So if you um, think of the term patient and it, it, you automatically start to roll your eyes or, you know, expect problems or anything like that then this lesson is for you because we really have to go all the way back to the beginning and think about what brought us into healthcare. Why did we get here to begin with? And for the majority of, the, of you, I think it probably was because you had a desire to help people. But when we get into the industry and we start working and we're short staffed and the call lights won't stop and nobody's willing to help us and all of these issues come up. We have bad managers and um, it just it, there's a lot of stuff in healthcare that can turn it into a negative experience really quickly. Well, if you're experiencing a negative workplace, then it's only natural for you to project that onto the patients and this is where we tend to get into a lot of problems as healthcare providers because um, we might be dissatisfied with our work environment, but we unfortunately kind of um, make it all about the patients are the problem. And the patients aren't the problem. The patients are the reason we get a paycheck. So we have to kind of twist this a uh, little bit and remind ourselves why we're here in the first place. And to do that, we're gonna talk about dignity. Now, dignity has a lot of different uh, meanings. If you go online and you type in what is dignity, you'll get a ton of different meanings, but I'm gonna kind of simplify this just a little bit. So patient dignity especially refers to the inherent worth and value of every individual, okay? so. That it's a very blanket statement. What does that even mean, right? But it means that I am worth something. I am an individual. I have my own hopes and dreams and thoughts and feelings. And I should be basic human rights here treated as an individual. And um, along with that, comes uh, some other words that we hear a lot like respect and uh, awareness and communication. And we're going to talk about all of these things in a little bit, but um, this is how we provide dignity and promote dignity when we're working with our patients. Um, so it's, it's one of those kind of buzzwords that means a whole lot, 
but most people just overlook it and keep doing whatever it is they're doing. And I really kind of want to challenge you to think about this just a little bit differently. Okay. So this is kind of my simplified um, explanation of dignity and respect, right? So dignity is about rec recognizing the value of each person as an individual and then treating them with respect and compassion. So when we're working in a clinical setting, what does that mean? Well, if we've got an older patient that maybe is on the call light a whole lot, constantly complaining, um, feels like they're not being heard, um, complains about everything, uh, we as caregivers will try to avoid that person. We'll kind of, it'll, we'll be a little slower answering the call lights because, oh my gosh, she's on there again. Um, we might uh, turn a deaf ear to their complaining and just totally ignore what they're saying. Um, we tend to try to protect ourselves by distancing ourselves from this kind of negativity. But I want to turn that around for just a minute. And when we start looking at this from a dignity standpoint, that whole scenario changes a little bit. So our patients that are on the call lights nonstop they may seem like a nuisance to us because we're the ones that have to answer the call lights. But in reality, the patient is having an unmet need. And if you think about it from that standpoint, instead of, oh my gosh, they're on the call light again. If we look at it as, okay, wait a minute, they're on the call light again, which means there's something going on that they just don't feel like their needs are being met. So what can I do to help that? If you are on the side of dignity and respect versus annoyance and irritation, you're going to respond to this situation a whole lot differently, right? So we need to understand that each patient has the right to um, express their thoughts and their feelings and their frustrations, just like you and I do. Um, but it, we have the responsibility to take all of that seriously and to promote dignity rather than distance. Does that kind of make sense, guys? Does that kind of make sense? Let's see who's here. Hi, Helen. Hi, Maureen. Hey, Blue. Um, hi, Jorge. Uh, waiting for the date of your exam. Oh, good. We're going to send good vibes out your way. Lou says, I just taught an hour of continuing education class on Tuesday on just this. Awesome. I'm so glad that, yeah, Blue, we seem to be very aligned in what we're, um, you know, what we're uh, producing. So that's awesome. That's awesome. So I want you to think about this in this way, right? Dignity or patient rights, which dignity is a part of, is not just a nice thing. It's an actual human right. We are we have the right to um, be respected. So our society kind of gets this wrong, especially when we're dealing with patients. A lot of people go into healthcare thinking that a patient is dependent, reliant on us. Therefore, they have to do what we say. And that's actually not true. Patients are independent people with rights. And we have to be really, really careful. So this, this actually came up not too long ago. Somebody had asked me, well, what if the patient refuses you know, to do a skill? And I said, well, that's okay. The patient's allowed to refuse. And they were actually really surprised by that. What do you mean they're, they're allowed to refuse? They are. They're allowed to say no. If they don't want to shower, they can say no. Just like you can decide not to take a shower tonight if you don't want to take a shower. Or if you prefer to have showers in the morning, right? You have preferences. Um, now, we do have to fit into the facility schedule sometimes. That So we may have some scheduling difficulties, but the patients have the right to be heard and to try to come up with something that um, fits their lifestyle and their schedule as well as ours. This is a right that they have and it promotes dignity. We're not just trampling over them saying, we don't care what you want or how you feel. We're going to do it our way. That's not dignity. 
understanding that, okay, the patient likes morning showers, but we don't have a space on our morning shower team right now. So we would talk to the patient and explain, Mrs. Murphy, I'm sorry, we don't have a spot on morning showers. Are you okay with evening showers until we can get our schedule um, rearranged, right? So we're going to work with them. That promotes dignity and respect instead of just saying, nope, you're here. You're going to do what we want you to do and that's it. So understanding that the patient has their own thoughts and feelings and preferences is a big part of dignity and doing our best to promote those is the other half, right? So we have to understand and then we have to respect. So this can get a little bit um, difficult when we're dealing with difficult patients though. So how do we make this work? And what, you know, this whole big lecture, I mean, I could go on this for hours and hours and hours and hours. How do I cut this down? How do I make this so that it's easy to implement? So that you're always putting your patient's needs first. How do I make that point? And as I was creating these slides and as I was um, trying to develop this lesson, something came into my mind that I learned when I was very, very slow. And, and you probably learned it too somewhere along the way. But this is a lesson that we generally teach small children, but it's so relevant. And I think that it deserves repeating in adulthood. And it's something called the golden rule. Now, a lot of you already know what the golden rule is. But for those of you who don't, the golden rule is to treat others the way you would want to be treated in that situation. It's very simple. If I am, um, let's say that I'm riding um, a high speed train and there an elderly woman gets on and there's no seats left and I'm capable of standing, um, I could potentially give up my seat for that woman or I could decide, nah, she's fine. She can stand. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to inconvenience me. So me personally, I let this principle guide most of my decisions when I'm working with other people, right? So if this elderly woman got on and she's standing there on this high-speed train and there's no seats available, I would think to myself, okay, how would I want to be treated when I get to be that age? Would I want somebody to recognize the fact that standing on a moving train might be more difficult for somebody that may have some coordination issues because of muscle atrophy and nerve degradation because of the aging process, right? So it would be nice if somebody would give up their seat for me as an older individual. So I would, based on that thought process, I would probably offer, ma'am, would you like my seat? I'm happy to stand, right? I'm going to treat her the way that I would want to be treated if I were in that situation. Does that make sense? So this is called the golden rule. And it's a really simple way to live. And if you adapt this to every decision that you make, you'll end up putting other people first. And um, I find that it really does work pretty well for me. Now, I'm not perfect. I don't get this right all the time. And I have had some interactions with people that afterwards I thought, well, I didn't handle that well, <laughs> right? But life is a learning process. We don't get everything right all the time. We're going to learn as we go and hopefully get a little better with the next interaction. So if you don't get this right the first time, don't give up. This takes a lot of practice, okay, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes when you're going to make a decision. But let me give you one that relates specifically to healthcare. And I want you to put yourself in this person's position so you can decide how you would react to this, okay? So let's say that we have a patient in a long-term care facility and the patient is going to be taken to the shower room for a shower. So they're not being showered in their own room. There's a shower room down the hallway and we are going to take that person to the shower room to be showered. So 
if you are that patient, would it be better for them to completely undress you in your room? You are completely naked. They put you in a shower chair, completely naked in the in your room, and then wheel you out of your room, down the hallway, and into the shower room, completely naked. Is anybody okay with that? I wouldn't be. I certainly wouldn't be, because that is definitely going to... Um, <laughs> I'm going to be embarrassed. You know, first of all, I have to be showered. That's a huge blow to my ego that I can't, you know, I'm not independent in that. So that I'm going to have some, some ego issues, that loss of, of independence. There's an exposure issue here because I don't want everybody to see me naked. I, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. There's a um, comfort issue here, right? It's cold in these facilities and you're going to wheel the patient all the way down to the shower room completely, completely naked. They're going to get cold right before they get into the shower. Um, there's a, um, you know, a patient rights violation because the patient has the right to, um, you know, have their privacy protected. So there's, there's a lot of issues here. And yet I see this being done in long-term care facilities. Now, a lot of CNAs will just throw a blanket over the patient and not think anything of it and wheel them down there. Well, first of all, wheeling somebody in a hallway in a shower chair isn't doing anything to promote their dignity at all. Um, shower chairs are, they, they kind of are like, um, Toy, like bedside commodes on wheels, right? So it's like a toilet seat that you're sitting on. It's it's not private. It's a little demeaning. <laughs> it's, you know, they're, they're good for being able to get in all the nooks and crannies to clean somebody, but it's not really designed to be a transport chair. So this situation, if I were putting myself in the patient's position I would think to myself, yeah, that's probably not how I would want to be treated. So what's another alternative? Well, another alternative is to transport the patient in a wheelchair to the shower room, get them undressed immediately before the shower, clean them up, and then get them dressed before you take them back into a public area. Now, I know, I get it. I've worked in healthcare a very long time, and I know that those are extra steps that you don't want to take. And you, for a lot of times, don't have time to take because you're so rushed. But is that really an excuse? I mean, think about it. If you were the patient, would you accept that as an excuse? Would you be okay with being naked in a public setting because somebody doesn't want to take the time to make sure that you're covered. I mean, I get it from a healthcare perspective. I do. I'm, I, I completely commiserate with you, but really it's not about us and it should never be about us, should it? It should always be about the patient. We are there to provide patient care. That is our whole reason for being in this facility and getting a paycheck to provide patient care. So the patient should be at the center of the care, not we're providing care and the patient is a byproduct. It's all about how you look at it. Does that make sense? Let's see what you guys say. Um, let me see here. Let's see what you have to say about this. So, um, Let's see here. Going to take some notes in case I missed something. Oh, thanks, Blue. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, Mackendia, Mackendi, Mackendina, Mackendina. Um, Blue says, let's see here. My thing, if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're a HCA and your client is Catholic and they want to ride to their weekly quilting circle, the world is not going to end if you take them. Amen, Blue. We'll talk about that. We will. I'll bring that into this. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Dalal. Um, Let's see here. It has everything to do with dignity and respect of the client. It's not a personal thing about making you do something you're not comfy with. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer says, so how come 
it isn't considered a HIPAA violation when you go visit somebody in the hospital and the hospital staff gives you the room number of the patient. Okay, we'll talk about that. Lou says, to help a client maintain dignity and respect, keep an open mind, be willing to learn and try new things. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay, so let me get to that. Let, let's talk about what Blue is, is saying. Okay, so let's say that you are a particular religion, pick one, I don't care, pick one, and your patient is not that religion for whatever reason. And I did a whole lesson on religion. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Um, but uh, the, the patient needs help. They can't go to their religious services by themselves. So they need help. Now, this could be in a facility, by the way, and this could be in a home care setting. It could be in assisted living. But um, your patient needs some help. So you're assigned, hey, go take this patient to this service. And you think to yourself, oh, no, 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 I'm not that really. You go find somebody that's that religion to take her because I'm not going. It's not my religion. Well, your religion doesn't have anything to do with it. Your belief system really doesn't have anything to do with it. The assignment is to take care of the patient and help the patient attend to their own religious needs, right? Your, your religious needs is not anywhere in that care plan. They don't really um, factor in here at all. You don't have to participate in the meeting. You don't have to um, do anything other than care for the patient. That That is your role. Your role is to care for the patient. The patient's role is to participate in the meeting. So it's important that we understand our roles here. Now, if you are attending a religious meeting yourself, then that's different. Now your role is to participate in the meeting, right? But when you're going as a caregiver, your role is not to participate in the meeting. It's to take care of the patient and the patient's role is to participate in the meeting. So this is really, really important. And this goes to pretty much anything, whether it's religious services or a quilting um Thing or taking them to a theme park. I mean, that does happen too. I was in pediatrics for a while, many years actually, and um, I actually got paid to take a child to a theme park so that the child could experience the wonder and the magic and the crowds and the heat <laughs> and all of that. Well, you know, I could have gotten very bitter because I can't ride any of these rides. I'm, you know, but that wasn't my role. I wasn't there to participate in the theme park. I was there to care for my patient. My patient was there to participate in the theme park. So we have to rearrange our thinking here, right? So we have to ha go at this at a, a little bit different angle. Th but this goes the same for showering a patient, right? We're not there to make things easier for ourselves. We're there to make things easier for the patient. So making that switch, that, that transition, and I talk about this a lot in my classes, it's always about the patient. And if you know anything about my big five, right, this, the big five, this, this, these five things sum up your entire, um, how do I put this, uh, the scope of practice of a CNA right? These five things. We follow the care plan, the whole care plan, nothing but care plan. CNAs do normal. That's routine tasks on stable patients, according to the care plan. Principles guide our performance. I teach you all about the principles and training, how to do washing skills, scoot and roll, how to use a gate belt. Those principles guide performance. But above everything else, you've got these last two. They form the roof. The last two is it's always about the patient and report everything to the RN. Those are the two most important overriding principles of your scope of practice. It's all about the patient. So I talk about this a lot in my training, but here on my li weekly lives, I actually get to connect to people that are currently working in healthcare that may be past the training. And that's why I like to bring a lot of these um, topics in and talk to you guys about them because you may have learned this in CNA school or maybe you didn't, but it bears uh, talking about for sure, okay? It's something that we should have on our radar. So our golden rule is to always treat patients the way we would want to be treated if we were in that situation, right? 
So there's some rules that go with this. Like anything else, we've got some rules to follow. So the number one rule here, my body, my choice, my rules, period. Your patient has the right to say no. And they are, uh, we have to listen to that. They are in charge of their body. Now, a question I always get asked, well, what about dementia patients? What about dementia patients? Dementia patients are a little bit different because with dementia patients, their rights have been suspended in a court of law. <laughs> um, and those rights have been removed because they can't, they are unable to make good choices for themselves and keep themselves safe. So in that case, our care plan is going to dictate a little bit more. But outside of dementia, this rule applies. So unless your, pa your patient has had their rights suspended, they have the right to say no. That's anywhere, to anything, to anyone, at any time. So if you are going in to do peri care and you start exposing the patient, you pull the sheet off, you pull their gown off and they're laying there completely exposed and they're feeling very, very uncomfortable with this, very vulnerable. If they duck and cover and tell you, no, 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 you cannot force them. <coughs> you can't force them. It would be like me coming into your home at two o'clock in the morning, tomorrow morning, and completely undressing you and exposing you. You're not going to have any clue why I'm there or what I'm doing, or you're probably going to resist because this isn't right. So a lot of this is actually going to be in our approach, right? So if we go into that patient's room and we say, Miss Mary, I need to do peri care. I know you're sleeping. I'll make this quick, but I got to get you cleaned up, okay? If you do it that way, your patient's going to be way more likely to cooperate than if you just come in and try to run right over them and do the tasks that you're there to do. So the first rule we have to follow is my body, my choice, my rules. Patients have the right to say no, and we have the responsibility to listen. But if we watch our own approach, we can actually avoid a lot of this, right? Most people will say no if they're uncomfortable or unfamiliar with what you're about to do. Now, this is one of my favorites. Help doesn't help if help isn't help if it doesn't help, right? Um, and this is one that's kind of hard to get across to people. So the example that I use is when I hired a house cleaner. I hired a house cleaning company. I assumed they knew what I wanted done. We didn't really discuss a whole lot. They came in, spent a couple hours. They cleaned. I paid them. They left. And then I started looking around. Sliding glass doors only got cleaned as high as they could reach. <laughs> Floors mopped around the rugs. They're just little tiny throw rugs. They could have picked them up very easily and mopped under them. They didn't. They mopped around them. Um, the mirrors uh, were only cleaned up to a certain level. The countertops, nothing was moved. So yes, I had a house cleaner and they did some things, but they really didn't do the things the way I wanted them done. So was it really help? No, I can tell you it really wasn't. Yes, they did some things, but they really didn't do what I needed done. And part of that is because I really did. I really wasn't clear with my expectations, what I expected of them. So there's two parts to this. We need to have clear expectations, but we also need to make sure that we're listening to understand those expectations. And that way we can make sure that we're truly meeting the needs of the patient. Does that make sense, guys? Truly meeting the needs of the patient. So help isn't help if it doesn't really help. I haven't had a house cleaner since because I'm a little bit gun shy. You know, I just kind of figure it's easier for me to do it. And most of your patients are going to be like that too. If you go in to do a task, and they don't like the way it's done, they're probably going to be resistant the next time around. They're just going to be like, no, I'll, I'll take care of it. So help has to help to truly be help, right? All right. So whenever we're working with patients and we're discussing dignity, we always want to make sure we're putting ourselves in the place of that patient. So take a minute to look at them. Do you think they feel vulnerable? 
right? If you've got a patient laying there and they have no sheets on and they're completely exposed and they're laying down, chances are they feel a little vulnerable at the moment. So we need to adjust our approach based on that. We need to figure out, do they feel exposed? And is there something we can do to minimize that? Do they feel understood? Are they saying things and we're actually taking it in and listening? Do they feel respected? Now, this is a big one because patients that need help, that really require care, they're automatically going to feel uh, a little bit insecure. They're probably going to feel a little bit frustrated over their, their current dependence level they're probably going to feel like they're an imposition because these are things that they used to be able to do for themselves and now they got to rely on some other human to do them. There's a lot of negative feelings that go into requiring care from another human, basic care. There's a lot of negative um, impacts there. So if you come in and they're automatically already feeling these things and then you come in and you make them feel feel inferior because you're talking down to them, you're not communicating, you're not listening to what they have to say, you're not respecting them, um, they can become very um, resistant to care. And I've seen it happen a lot. So respect and dignity really go hand in hand. We are going to promote dignity by respecting our patients. And again, it goes back to that golden rule. How would you want to be treated if you were in that situation? So here's one that I saw not too terribly long ago. Um, I was walking down a hallway and in a patient's room, the door was not closed. The privacy curtain was not drawn. The patient is laying there. There's a caregiver in there bathing the patient and the patient is completely exposed and I closed the door. You know, I, I walked over it and started to close the door and the CNA actually said to me out loud, it doesn't matter, she's not aware. Awareness has no impact at all on respect or dignity. I don't care if they're aware or not. That respect and dignity is not conditional on whether they understand what's happening. Respect and dignity is inherent. It's going to be provided regardless of the situation that the patient finds themselves in. Does that make sense? It's That's not an excuse. You can't just completely disregard respect and dignity because your patient is uh, has dementia or is immobile or is comatose. That, that has no bearing on it at all. There's no rule that says, yeah, you're going to provide respect and dignity as long as your patient knows what you're doing. That, that, that rule doesn't exist. Respect and dignity is universal always, always. Um, and that's uh, something that we kind of have to grab a hold of. Um, and I've seen that probably way more than I should have. All right. So here's some practical tips. So how can you as a caregiver show respect and promote dignity when working with your patients? Well, the number one thing is to make sure you're involving your patients in decisions. I mean, that's a big one. You want to make sure that they're a partner in their health care, not a byproduct of. So how much are you talking to your patients? How much are you getting to know them? How much are you involving them in those, these day-to-day -day decisions? How much are you um, promoting their uh, dignity, right? How much, how much are you showing them respect? Explaining procedures and expectations. This is big. This goes back to what I was talking about with the house cleaner. So we need to be talking about expectations. Um, you know, that this communication breaks down when expectations are not clear. That's when communications break down. So here's a good example of this. When I had children and they were younger school age children and they all had chores to do because I'm a big proponent of instilling responsibility in children. So they all had chores to do. 
And I told them what I wanted done and then I kind of left them to do it, but I didn't really give them very clear expectations and they didn't do the chores the way I wanted them done because they were kids and kids aren't going to know how I want things done. So I typed out a detailed list of exactly what I wanted done, posted it on the inside of the um, cabinet so that when they were, it was their turn to clean the kitchen. They could look at it. They could see exactly what needed to be done and make sure that they were hitting all those points. And then when I got home, I was able to praise them for a job well done. Now, this did two things. First of all, it taught them how to clean a kitchen very well. Um, but the second thing it did was it set them up for success. Rather than getting them to try to figure it out, it set them up for success because both parties now understand the roles and the expectations. Well, we can do this with patients as well. If I'm going to transfer a patient out of bed and into a wheelchair, I'm going to set up expectations. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to pivot you around to sit on the side of the bed and put your shoes on. Now I'm going to put the gate belt on. You're going to put your hands on my shoulders and on the count of three, we're going to stand up, pivot. And when you feel that chair behind your legs, I want you to say sit. When you say sit, I'll lower you into the chair. OK, so very clear expectations. But I'm also going to involve the patient in the conversation. Are you OK with that? Are you feeling OK? Um, is, you know, this wheelchair adjusted properly, you know, whatever I need to do to involve them in the process. But it's really, really important to explain procedures and to establish very clear expectations on both sides. You want to make sure that you check your tone of voice. This is important because sometimes we get really, really busy and I, I'm guilty of this. I just talked to my son on the phone and I probably used the wrong tone of voice when I talked to him because I had so many things going on. I don't get this right all the time. But if you're aware of it, you'll make less errors, right? So try to pay attention to your tone of voice. How are you speaking to the patient? A lot of times it's not the words that we're using that's disrespectful. It's how we deliver those words our tone of voice, are we facing the patient? Are we making eye contact? Are, or are we easily distracted, looking in a different direction, um, hurried, rushed, um, you know, a, a, a very strong tone of voice? So how are you approaching the patient? I can tell you, you get way further with patients by being nice than you ever will by being mean always. So if you're approaching the patient with that nice, calm, friendly, reassuring tone, your patients are going to feel more like partners. They're going to feel like you're there to help them not to take over. Monitor your nonverbal communication too. So posture, which way are you facing? Are you making eye contact? Are you rushing the patient? Are you just throwing the sheets off and moving the patient quickly and grabbing body parts. And we don't want to do that. Pay attention to your nonverbal cues as well. You want to make sure the patient is comfortable. And that's not just physical comfort. That's also emotional comfort. So comfort is going to be key here when we're trying to promote dignity and show respect. Minimizing exposure. We talked about that a lot today. You don't want to expose your patient unnecessarily. It does have a profound impact on their um, sense of dependence, on their vulnerability, on perceived threats uh, to their safety and security. Exposure is a big one, guys. And we tend to be okay with exposure. I've seen them all. I don't really care anymore. Who cares? But that's not how the patient is perceiving this. That patient doesn't care that you have seen it all before. You haven't seen all of them and they don't want the world to see all of them. So your perception of this situation is completely different than your patient's. And you need to be aware of that, especially when it comes to exposure. You want to make sure you're listening to understand, not to respond. And this is this is a big uh, difference here. Most of us listen when somebody else is talking and we're formulating our response. We're trying to figure out what we're going to say in response to that. And if you're thinking about what you have to say in this conversation, you are not paying attention to what they mean by what they're saying. 
So you need to be listening to understand, then respond. Okay, that's a big one. And you want to make sure you're interacting appropriately with that patient. Make them feel like you want to be there and help them, that you're not just, um, that they aren't intruding on your time. I've seen a lot of caregivers that give off that vibe with patients. Now, imagine for a second that you are too ill to be at home and you were transferred to a nursing home. And this is where you're going to live out the rest of your days is in this nursing home. And nobody there seems to care. They don't care that you're there. They don't care who you are. They don't care what you want. They don't care if you're exposed. They don't care that your life totally imploded around you. And that this is not what you had in mind for the rest of your life. They don't care. You probably wouldn't live very long because you're going to give up because it seems like nobody cares. And that's a horrible thing to do to our patients. They've already been dealt some massive blows. It's not our job to, you know, finish them off. That, and that's what we're going to do by making them feel like they're an imposition. You want to empathize with them. You want to sympathize with them. But most of all, you want them to feel that they are cared for and cared about. And if you do that, your patients will have a much more pleasant um, experience. They'll also automatically become way more compliant. They'll um, work with you a whole lot better. You'll get fewer call lights. You'll get fewer complaints. Um, it's a positive experience all the way around. So remember that patients rely on caregivers for both physical and emotional care. And if you focus on both sides of that, if you're focusing on how to perform the skills, but also how you are interacting with the patient when you perform those skills. So that physical care and that emotional care, if you focus on both of those, your patient will have an ideal caregiving experience. And this is ultimately what I'm betting drew you into healthcare to begin with. So sometimes we need that reminder to get back on track because life beats us down and there's no shade on you for that. It happens to the best of us. Life beats us down and we get into that day to day routine and we start to look at the patients as call lights and problems rather than people with needs. So if we can just remember what brought us into healthcare in the first place, you'll probably nail this respect and dignity again. We just need that little reminder to get us on the right track. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's lesson. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. So let's see here. Um, all right. So Jennifer had asked, let me pull this up here. Where's Jennifer. Oops, hold on. Okay, so Jennifer asks, so how come it isn't considered a HIPAA violation when you go to visit someone in the hospital and the hospital staff gives you the room number of the patient? Well, it's not a HIPAA violation because a room number doesn't really identify the patient. So if I tell you room 214, anybody that's standing there listening, they don't know who is in room 214. So it's not a real patient identifier. Now, if I said Mr. Hyde in room 214, now, Mr. Hyde is a patient identifier. Okay, so room numbers, they're not considered protected health information because there's lots of people that could be in room 214, especially in a hospital. The, the people in room 214 are going to change pretty much daily, right? So that's not a patient identifier. Things that would readily identify the patient, like name, um, age and sex, uh, social security number, those types of things that are specific to that patient, that is a patient identifier. All right. So you also asked in psychiatry, even if a family member knows the patient's first and last name, we can't admit that they are there without an ROI. Why is it different on a different unit? Okay. So that's a good question. Part of this is going to be facility guidelines, okay? So part of this is going to be based on the facility. 
Um, with HIPAA, we aren't supposed to be giving any information on any patient to anyone who doesn't have a medical need to know without the patient's express permission. And that is universal. That is HIPAA. That applies to all patient settings. Now, in a hospital, generally speaking, when you get admitted to the hospital, they will ask um, if somebody calls, can we give them your room number? Do you want us to uh, let, you know, can we admit that you're here? So that's part of the admissions process. But in psychiatry, we actually take an extra step and we don't just verbally ask. We generally, now this is based on your facility. Not all facilities will do this. This is a facility regulation, but in psychiatry or mental health, it's usually an extra step. And uh, that is because with mental health, we don't, we, we have an at risk patient and uh, mental health is um, one of those modalities that you can have a patient set back very, very quickly with mental health. So especially if they're there on a, in Florida, we call it a Baker Act, um, but a law enforcement seclusion uh, process. So if we have a patient who was um, placed in a psychiatric facility against their will, for three days to evaluate their psychiatric state of mind. So when we have um, an involuntary um, admission, we can't release their information. We, we just can't because we don't really, we, we don't have the right to do that. Um, a voluntary admission usually will require a written consent from the patient telling us who we can tell and what we can tell. So mental health usually has a few extra layers because of the, um, the serious nature of their treatment. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to word that. <laughs> so that would be a facility requirement. All right. So let's see who else. Uh, good evening, Melissa. Blue says, if someone is grumpy, an example, refusing a shower or get out of bed, and it's out of character for them, without judging them, ask open-ended questions about why. Absolutely, Blue, you're absolutely right, especially if it's out of character. So if somebody is having a bad day, we've all had bad days. I've had one. I had one this week. I had a bad day this week. Absolutely. We've all had those bad days. So if it's out of character for your patient, try to get to the bottom of what's going on, but always tell the nurse, always tell the nurse. Um, yeah, maybe their pet rat died. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's days I don't want to adult either. <laughs> Let's see here. The person you closed the door on, I will tell you the family will have a massive problem with that and with what the CNA was doing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That is that situation there is absolutely no excuse for and i will stand up for that patient every day of the week every day that is somebody's family member i don't care whether they're unaware of what's happening around them i don't care that does not enter into this equation at all ever and you're right the family would have a pro i would have i have and i wouldn't i would have a problem with that Okay. So it's not that I might have a problem as a caregiver. I have a massive problem with that as a family. They will also have a massive problem with that. Yeah. You don't get to, you don't get to break the rules because you don't think they apply. The rules apply. <laughs> All right. So um, yes, you have to ask if anyone you don't want to visit you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Patients have the right to determine um, what appropriate, you know, what, what they want for their care. So Blue responded to Jennifer and said, mental health hospitals have a very different set of rules that apply to them that doesn't apply to normal hospitals. Yes, absolutely. Mental health hospitals have special needs that go above and beyond a normal hospital. Yeah. And the, like I said, that's going to be more facility specific based on the population that they're working with. Yep. Yep. Good afternoon, Sonia. All right. Great questions today, guys. Um, this was a good meeting. I'm glad that we had this one. So uh, before I get into today's congratulations, um, we're going to get to that in just a second here. We're going to get to the congratulations. But before that, I want to let you know, I will be here with you next Thursday. 
I will have our normal weekly next Thursday, but the one after that, so in two weeks from today, I will not be live that Thursday because I'm going to be out of town at a conference. I'm going to a YouTube conference for um, uh, high growth YouTube channels and um, we are high growth YouTube channel. So we're going to go to that conference. I will be coming to you. I will be doing a live from there sometime that week. I don't know what day. I don't know what time. It's going to be a totally surprise live. It's going to be like in between when I'm, you know, got a minute between running around, I'll grab my phone and we'll go live really quick so I can um, involve you and you can see what, you know, what I'm doing and where I'm at and how it's going and all of that. Um, I'm going to get to see some really cool people. I'm super, super excited. So in two weeks, we will not have our normal live lesson on Thursday. And I'll remind you again next week. I will go live either Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. I'm not sure what day. So if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, and that's something that would interest you, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell. That way, when I go live, it lets you know right away and you can join because it won't be a very long one. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely be able to bring you on board and kind of show you around. And and uh, maybe you'll get to see some uh, high ranking YouTubers in the background. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, that that's going to be all kinds of fun. So remember, in two weeks, we won't have our live next week. We will. And I'll remind you next week as well. So here we go. Let's go ahead and congratulate those that passed the state exam. We have Amori Spina, 7806. Congratulations to you. Sabine Bertrand, congratulations. Anya Bilohorova, congratulations to you. And Rose Gold 33. Great job, guys. I'm super, super proud of you. And welcome to the wonderful world of healthcare. If you want a shout out, Go on to any of my videos on YouTube. Leave a fresh comment. Don't leave a reply. I don't always see those. Leave me a fresh comment on any one of my videos. Let me know that you tested and we'd be happy to send out a congratulations shout out to you as well and welcome you into healthcare. So if you are um, testing soon or if you have tested, let us know. We'd love to welcome you. Now, testing soon, we have Maureen James. Uh, who's going to be testing uh, soon. Uh, Jorge is going to be testing soon. And we have uh, Javante Page is awaiting results. Has tested, just waiting on those results. So good vibes out to you. So this has been a very, very good um, lesson today. I'm really excited. Uh, oh, thank you, Blue. That's so sweet. Blue says, whoops. I hope your puppy is doing well. She is doing fantastic, but she is all teeth. She, <laughs> I went, had to go out and buy a new comforter because she ate my old one. I mean, literally holes in it, stuffing all over. It was crazy. So I went out and bought a new comforter. Thankfully, I just went to, uh, you know, a discount store and got a cheap comforter because you know what she's done in the last week? She ate that one too. Yeah. And put holes in sheets. So <laughs> she's, it's a good thing. She's cute. Um, she's adorable. She is, she is my heart. I absolutely love her to pieces. Um, we're working on the chewing thing. We're working on it, but yeah, she's doing very well. I'll bring her in next week and you can see her right now. She's taking a nap. Um, other than that, otherwise she'll be in here munching on toys and I won't be able to hear. Um, let's see here. Uh, Blue says, our pooch got mad at the school bus driver stopping five feet from our driveway. Yes, that's, they do that. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's funny. That's good. All right, guys, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's lesson. Thank you for joining me. You guys are awesome to come hang out with me every Thursday. This is the highlight of my week. And uh, I absolutely love being here with you guys and being able to uh, interact with you and give a lesson. So we are going live on Mondays and Wednesday uh, next week for our classroom live stream. And um, I'll be back with you next Thursday for a lesson. And then after that, we're going to take a week off and I'll be going to the conference, but I will go live so you can join in. All right. So until next time, guys, happy caregiving. Bye.